Hello everyone, and today I want to talk to you about power in the curriculum. And I like to draw heavily on the cult to really define this idea with power inside of the classroom and what that means and how that operates. Um, and then in terms of the anti-schooling approach, if you want to go to the ultimate extreme, you, you can read Ivan Elick and the idea of de-schooling and how learning is really more about the informal education and the lifelong learning. But we also got to talk about criticality and understanding that tracing back those theories to their theoretical underpinnings of philosophies way above them. And so what that kind of really meant in terms of our learning. So let's think on the cult for a second. It was this idea of power in the classroom. And later in his writings, because they're never, power is never really defined because that would then represent having power. Um, so you take away out saying it's one of those concepts that's ill-defined. But it came down to this idea of actions upon actions. An action that would incite or excite, something that made stuff happen. So in a way, our curriculum is power. We have instructional routines that we want to excite, incite, and have kids be able to recite because of the power that we have as educators. I mean, to deny that there isn't a power relationship between a student and a teacher is silly. It's very beneficial having that imbalance of power. But how power plays out in the classroom really comes down to participation. And how participation is defined is really driven by your theoretical perspectives. A guided reading lesson built in direct instruction will put lace way more power in, say, the teacher, whereas a lesson based on more constructivist principles would have way more power in to the student. So we're needing to be thinking about those ideas. And this should, when you build out a curriculum, impact your decision making because we've talked about how you take something from theory and you break that down into your theoretical definitions and then you explain how you operationalize those definitions and we should see those in how you measure and then how you teach and in the limitations of that you acknowledge and how you kind of compensate for those limitations of your theory and when we're talking critical reading and critical literacy, it doesn't matter if it's controlling your understanding of the text from a critical reading perspective or questioning the powers behind the text from a critical literacy perspective. We understood that those trace back to either those humanist perspectives or even like Frankfurt School's idea of criticality or Fourierian liberation ideas of criticality. Even within that idea of critical there are different theoretical perspectives. So you, as an educator, in a master's program that's really starting to grow your understanding, you have to think about which philosophies guide your theories. How do your theories connect to research and practice? How do you operationalize this research into your classroom? In the example we use, we talked about farming books. You could romanticize the idea of the farm in that children's book and really just stay within the corners of those texts and think about rhyming patterns or the way images are in the foreground or the background. Or you can take a more critical literacy lens and be thinking, hmm, how is this different to an industrial farm? Are they romanticizing farm life when it's very different where our food comes from? Or maybe you place the agency into the students of your classroom who grow up on a farm and live on a farm, and can compare what farm life is like to the book version in the children's books. So it really boils down to an understanding of where control resides and in participation, and how that is implemented into your classroom. For example, when I student taught, I was in Waterbury, Connecticut, and the students all had a loose uniform assignment, uh, slacks, blue slacks, and a white button down or a white 
collared shirt or white skirt. I mean, blue skirt and white. I can't remember exactly, but students all had a uniform. The teachers didn't. So to me, that felt like an imbalance in power. I would never want my class to do something that I myself wouldn't be willing to do. So I just wore the same uniform every day. Um, to me, that's a better chance of building unit cohesion with my classroom than setting up a power differential between the teacher and the students that really is very easy to rectify and could maximize the benefits um, that researchers say uniforms have. But I don't, I didn't want to other my students. And that's just one example of how curriculum can kind of empower, have a relationship on the classroom outside of the classroom. But think about science of reading. Where did all of that power come from? Who is behind, who is funding those ask for turfing campaigns? This is a state by state effort to define reading in a very specific way. Why? That's the way that we have to read our professional text beyond our classrooms. But for you as students in thinking about contemporary curriculum theory, you need to consider your theory and then how it's operationalized into your classrooms. For example, I often use uh, and reflect on John Dewey and this idea of lived experience and increasing democracy in education and participation. Uh, and the idea for me there is you would then see that in how I teach and how I measure. So you'd want to see ideas of more experimentation, giving students more choice, uh, defining literacy as a form of leadership in how they shape the classroom and the meaning, and then taking, so they might just read a text write about that text, but then go do something in the world to make the world better about that text, using what they read and wrote about that text. That would reflect a Deweyan perspective. You could then, you could do the same thing and, and have a very discreet, direct approach to teaching phonics and say that, you know, it's based in this idea of Piagetian education. And it is. That's if you go back to Jean Chawl, you can you can make it the direct line to Piaget. That's where a lot of the science of reading information um, and that theoretical understanding of learning. That's where it traces back to. It just does. So, as we're reading about power and relationship in our classrooms, that's what I want you to think about. What is your theory? What is your why? Why are you here? What is it about curriculum that you want to learn? And how do you get students involved into owning their why in the classroom? It has to be more than just the objective you wrote on the board. Why do students need to understand that? What are the key levers that you want them to master and be able to reflect on and say, yes, I can do this thing. And then how do you build that why up? And this is also part of the reason you can't necessarily compare humanist lessons to those that might take a, say, a critical Freirean view of liberatory participation. The outcome measures would just be apples and oranges. And you're often working in a classroom where your boss is telling you just pitch nothing but mangoes. So power is a very important relationship in the classroom. Bye all.